And so uh, when it came to time to go back to the UK, I managed to persuade my news desk that, do you mind if I, instead of going coming back home now with the army, do you mind if uh, I'm going to Pakistan uh, and just see what's there? <laughs> um, and they said, well, you know, what, what are you going to do in Pakistan? And I said, well, firstly, I'm going to interview these British Muslims that have gone out there. Yeah. Uh, and then secondly, and it might sound outlandish, but I had as good a chance as anybody else of finding bin Laden. I mean, at this time, bin Laden had escaped from Afghanistan. They didn't know where he was. They thought he, that he was in this tribal areas. And I thought in my naive, young, adventurous way that, yeah, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll see if I can find him. And so that, that was, you know, that was what I told my news desk. So when it came time to come to the UK, instead, the army, British army dropped me off in Karachi. And this was interesting. The day I landed in Karachi um, in this army helicopter uh, from Kabul, um, I stayed there a night. The next morning, just as I caught my flight to Islamabad, a bomb went off in Karachi, killing 12 French sailors. So just bear that in mind. Uh, I then, under my own steam, make my way up to Lahore and Bashawar, where I, I had made a contact in England, somebody from the Human Rights Commission. And I said to him, look, can you arrange for me to go to Kabul? And what I wanted to do was go back to the same places I visited with the British Army and see what they say when there isn't a soldier with a gun standing around. Uh, and just generally try and, you know, try and get some real life interviews from real people rather than being embedded with the, you know, with the British or whatever. So he said to me, yeah, that's no problem. He goes, uh, obviously, you can't go alone, but uh, I'm a member of the Afridi tribe, the biggest tribe in that area. You might know of Shahid the Afridi, the cricketer, but the Afridis basically control the Khyber Pass. They've never been conquered. The British had to pay them. The Sikhs had to pay them access to the Khyber Pass, etc. So they're kind of, you know, a really strong race. They're about possibly a million strong, but then they're into sub-clans. So the Afridi clan has about seven sub-clans. And they're all called kind of Zakha Kiel, Adam Kiel, something Kiel. They all got Kiel at the end of it. Um, so anyway, he said, "Look, I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I've got cousins who live in the Khyber Pass. They, they will escort you to Kabul and back." So I said, "All right, that sounds all right." So it's quite weird. So you've got basically, you've got uh, Pakistan, and then Peshawar is one of the more most northerly places. Once you pass Peshawar, you've got this kind of thousand mile long corridor of land which is called the tribal areas. And no laws apply. Tribal laws apply. Uh, so everyone's carrying an AK-47. Everyone's smoking hash. So it, it's a real, it's a real weird feeling. So you go past the show, and then you see this sign that says "No foreigners beyond this point." Actually, it's misspelled, so it says "No foreigners behind <laughs> beyond this point." And it's like literally, as soon as you pass that point, it's like the lights have been switched off. All the hustle and bustle of the show goes, and you're in this. There's hardly any electricity. You hardly see anybody around. It's deadly silent. Uh, all you can hear is a few explosions of some rocket-propelled grenade going off somewhere because they're all feuding. They've got so many internal tribal disputes that they're all bombing each other. For... They don't live in houses. They live in little fortresses, little and castles. And this is, this is a space between Afghanistan and Pakistan, a Pakistan. corridor. Okay. Yeah. And are we, are we literally talking... Oh, actually, I think there was a lot of news about this when the West left Afghanistan and it was these areas which... Yeah. Like, we're yeah. basically like, yeah, try it. Yeah, so that was the area that Al-Qaeda and Bin Laden had slipped into and were hiding in. And here's me having the ear of the biggest tribe in that area. So I really did think, if anyone's going to help me find Bin Laden, these guys will. Um, but that was just a kind of pie-in-the-sky idea in the back of my head, really. So anyway, I end up uh, you know, going into the tribal areas, going to a place called Lundi Kotal. The first place, first place, the first town you come to, as soon as you get into the tribal areas, you see this massive mud fort that looks like something from the medieval ages. Really impressive, really big. And it was built by Holy Singh Nolwa. It was a Sikh fort. Uh, so Jamrud was his headquarters. And so the first place you go through is Jamrud. And I must admit, there was this excitement of, wow, I'm going to the land that Holy Singh Nolwa trod in. And, you know, that's his grave there and blah, blah, blah. So it was a real rush for me. Uh, but I was certainly aware that, Foreigners aren't allowed in the tribal areas. You, before you get your visa, you have to have a special visa to go in the tribal areas, and they wouldn't have given me one anyway. They, they rarely give, especially those times when it's the most dangerous place on earth. You know, nobody knows what's going on there. So there's me, kind of just stumbled into the place, haven't got the correct paperwork to be there, but have got the protection of the biggest tribe. 
So I got there and I'm just drunk on freedom. It's the most free, freest place I've ever seen. As in, you can do whatever you want. There's no laws. Everyone, you know, uh, it, people are carrying AK. So the first thing I wanted to do was give me a gun, let me fire it. So, you know, <laughs> I just grabbed an AK. And I was thinking, I said, well, just point it over there somewhere. And I was thinking, just over there somewhere. What, what if there's somebody standing there? And it's just, you know, literally, you know, so once I got over my excitement of, you know, guns, freedom, blah, 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 uh, I told him what I wanted to do. So the guy who, uh, who had taken me to the tribal areas was a, a local chieftain, Malik Dost Muhammad, his name was, really fierce looking guy, very gentle, but he had this kind of Mongol look about him, you know, because there's a lot of, because that area, so basically the history of the place, the Khyber Pass, before, if you wanted to invade India overland, uh, you had to go through the Khyber Pass. So everybody who invaded India from Genghis Khan to Alexander the Great to Attila the Hun, they all had to go through the pass. And I remember walking through the Khyber Pass thinking, wow, I'm walking to the same place that Alexander the Great's armies went through and Genghis Khan's army went through. So it's a really, you know, historic place. And Lundi Kortal is the highest point of the Khyber Pass. And so I was I was there. And anyway, the Malik introduced me to his son. Again, instantly there was a connection. He spoke English. His name was Noshad. And I really liked the fact that he was really straightforward. He came up to me and there was no niceties about, hello, who are you? It's like, what, what the fuck are you doing here? You know, well, how have you ended up here? Uh, uh, and so I explained it to him and, and said, look, this is what I want to do. I want to go to Afghanistan. I want to come back and you're going to take me. And he said, yeah, fine. So that night we had a really good night, man. We, they, they, they have their own, okay, they're Muslims, but their own tribal code supersedes their Islam. So they've got their own code called Pashtun Wali. And there's, there's hundreds of individual rules, but the two main th themes of Pashtun Wali are revenge and hospitality, two extremes. So hospitality to the extent of, you know, as Sikhs, we also have this big thing of, you know, the guest is the king and you're prone and should be after. They take it one step further. They will die for you. And if they don't, their tribe will ostracize them and demolish their house and banish them from the village. Um, yeah, and it doesn't matter if you're a if you're a fugitive, if you're a stranger, if if they take you in as a guest, they have to die for you. They have to look after you like better than your mother. Um, and so I'm a guest of this tribe, uh, and so you know they've got a duty to look after me. So not a penny has exchanged hands. I haven't given them any money. They don't know me from Adam. They've only met me, you know, 24 hours earlier. But one thing that was striking was. I've still got my gut up. I, I can't take it off. You know, I've had it since I was 14. It just doesn't come off. And as soon as every tribesman saw it, my ranking went up because it was, guess, oh, Sardarji. And it was like real respect. They still remember the days of Ranjit Singh and Hari Singh Malwa. And there's a bit of fear and a bit of admiration for our bravery as Sikhs. And if, I, if I'd been a Hindu or a Buddhist, I don't think I would have had that kind of welcoming reception or respect. And that really kind of, big to me up thinking yeah i am a sildar actually okay i haven't got the garb but uh, you know uh it kind of empowered me in a way and and made me feel sikhism in a different way i suppose um and so anyway um we had this really great night where they're drinking this homemade hooch that they make they call it the uh, uh, kyber water it's made from gunnin and stuff and uh we had a good drink and, and i had this watch and bear in mind this is 2002 i had this watch which had a camera in it it had just come out casio about 10 pixels, grainy, black and white, really crap, but still a gadget. And they were fascinated by it, and they were passing it around and taking photos. Of, Ooh, what's this time machine you've got here, or whatever. And so we had a great night. Anyway, the next morning, it kind of hit me, right, we're really going to Afghanistan now. And they dressed me up in a you know, Muslim shalwar kameez, or with a Muslim skull cap, uh, you know, and I had to pull my gut out in case, you know, they said, look, we don't know how other people are going to react to you as a Sikh in Afghanistan. So just keep that up and keep your sickiness, you know, out of the way. So again, we took a calculated risk. I didn't show any paperwork. I just basically, we got to the border. I knew I didn't have the right paperwork. And I thought my feeling was it's only a civil offense. It's not a criminal offense, not having the right documentations. And that, you know, knowing this part of the world, when I come back, I'll just pay somebody off and I'll be on my way uh, kind of thing. That was the kind of illusion I was under. So just when we were about to cross the border, I really started to shit myself thinking, shit, we're going here. <laughs> we're really going there. And not only are Al Qaeda there, there's Americans, there's this, there's that, there's bandits, there's all kinds of people that want me. And I remember really sheepishly asking Noshad, you know, 
is this safe are we going to die out there all right so that's the end of another episode i hope you guys enjoyed this as much as i enjoyed putting it together if you want to support the work that i'm doing then consider becoming a patreon member or a youtube member via the links in the description below thank you for tuning in hopefully i'll see you in the next podcast episode bye